ahead and meet our speakers. Um, you can see them here and we'll continue on so that I can introduce all of them live. Um, so let's, all right, we can click over the four box. Thanks, perfect. Um, I'm also on a delay just so everybody knows. Um, my internet went down one minute before we were supposed to go live. So I am on my phone's hotspot. So if you hear me having a delay or speaking over somebody, I so apologize. Um, we do what we can, we can with technology. All right, so let me introduce our team here. Um, below me, you'll see Adriti Gulati. Um, I'd love to welcome you. She is from HubSpot. Please go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody here. Welcome, lovely to have you. Um, all right, let's introduce Megan next. So Megan is a fellow smart bug um, that I've gotten the pleasure of working with for many years. Megan, I'll let you introduce yourself. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. And Jake, we also have Jake here. He is from Aircall, um, one of our technology partners, as well as a technology partner of HubSpot. Um, welcome and go ahead and introduce yourself. All right. Okay, so we're going to go ahead. I've got a note from our producers um, that we do, in fact, have the poll results available. Um, so I will go ahead and get those shared to the team. Give me one second here. We have to refresh when we set these up. All right. Perfect. We can go ahead and I believe we should be able to share my screen. There we go. All right, so thank you all for voting. Um, so, or not voting, for telling us how you currently use HubSpot's service hub tools. Um, so we've got about 20% of you that consider yourself a service hub expert. I love that. I would also love for you all to engage in the conversations then that happen in chat because you might have some insight and perspective that um, could be useful to your fellow attendees. About 70% of you said, yeah, you know about it, but you would like to learn more and, and how to leverage it you know, really well within your organization. Um, I love to hear it because that's, that's what we're here for. Um, and 10% of you are totally brand new. Also wonderful. You can evaluate if this is something that you know makes sense for your organization, for your current strategies, or maybe if it's something that you want to dive into in you know the second half of the year. So so glad to have you all here. All right, we can dive into question one. So um, as we really you know kind of fall into talking about Service Hub here and using the flywheel to reduce that friction and fuel your lead generation. Um, I wanted to give you all a, a little bit of like some tips before we dive into the first question. So um, one, if you're looking to learn more about Service Hub after this webinar, there is a certification in the HubSpot Academy and you can even gain bits of Service Hub knowledge um, and see Adriti in other courses and certifications. Um, I just took one this past week that was like inbound optimization and there's a whole section in there that's also tied to Service Hub. So um, just know that there's a, a wealth of knowledge in the Academy for you. Um, the next thing is, so Aircall is the only phone integration that HubSpot is invested in and the only phone system with a service hub integration that allows you know things like automatic ticket creation, logs to calls, et cetera. Um, so if you're looking for that kind of a solution, um, Airtal, Aircall fits in very nicely here and, and works very nicely with HubSpot. And then the last thing is, um, this is really for, this is for pro and enter enterprise HubSpot users. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're going through, if you're an individual that doesn't yet have access um, to Service Hub, that that's, that's kind of what's going on there. All right, enough from me. Let's hear from our panel. Um, so 
you know, one of the questions that we hear a lot are what are the best practices for setting up Service Hub to start capturing that insightful customer feedback? We hear things like, I bought this because I know that we need to improve our customer service program, but what do I do with Service Hub? I can dive in here, Nikki. Um, so yes, we get that question quite a bit. Um, I have Service Hub, so let's get it up and running. Let's start sending out surveys. And it's like, okay, as far as best practices go, you'll probably want to start by outlining your goals. So when you were ready to start using Service Hub, did you want to better understand how your current customers feel about you now? Do you want to start measuring their happiness on an ongoing basis? Or maybe you have a specific interaction with a client or customer and you want to measure how that engagement went. So no matter the reason, you just want to have a clearly identified goal and then an action plan in place once you start um, reaching out to these customers. So maybe uh, some of the feedback you get on your surveys aren't going to be positive. And that's okay. That's why you're sending them. But you'll want to make sure that you have an action plan in place before that first survey is sent. And then from there, you can decide what's the best so action plan and goals and then what's the best steps as far as moving forward with um, technical implementation which i think jake is going to talk a little bit about too yeah um i think those are all uh, i think that's all, all fantastic points i think on, on what i would say here especially in terms of capturing feedback is step one uh, identify all the channels that you're using to speak to customers and to prospects. Um, are you talking to them on the phone, email, chat, SMS, um, WhatsApp? Uh, how are you talking to customers? Identify those and make sure that they're all, uh, what you're using for all of those channels uh, is integrated in a way where everything is flowing into HubSpot automatically. If it's a human process involved with copying and paste and manual data entry, uh, comms will get lost. They're not going. They're not all going to make it into uh, into, into HubSpot, and you're going to lose valuable feedback uh, and insights. Um, I think past that step two is start identifying uh, how you want to classify uh, conversations with customers. Um, so uh, different types of calls, different types of chats and emails. Make sure like scope out the different types of conversations you're having. Um, so we can set up reporting, uh, tagging, and start to understand how do we want how do we want to classify these and uh, uh, make your life a lot easier in, in identifying um, uh, those customers. And this probably goes without saying, but you'll also want to make sure that... solely off of visual cues here right now, since I can't hear any of you. Um, it looks like looks like Jake has finished his thought. I am so sorry. <laughs> Um, is there is there anything else that anybody has to add on this? Nikki, I don't think you can probably hear me, but I was just going to add, it goes without saying that you'll want to make sure your customers are in HubSpot and ready to be reached out to and that your customer success team is also bought in on your action plan and what they're taking part in. All right, um, I will help us move on to the next question. So what are the different survey tools available in HubSpot and Service Hub? Um, how do they compare and contrast? You know, it might be useful for our audience to hear um, some use cases and just kind of how we help our clients with these sorts of things. I'm happy to tackle that one. So we have a customer feedback tool that truly takes care of everything you need for your feedback journey from creating those surveys, automation to send them out at the, the right time. So you're reaching the right folks at the right time um, and then dashboard so that you can evaluate that data um, and make sure that you're actually using it in the correct way. Uh, so we have four different types of surveys. Three are industry standard. Um, we have NPS, and that is the, you know, the classic. Everyone here has probably filled one out. Um, how likely are you to recommend X company to a colleague or friend? I would say if you are 
um, just starting out on your feedback journey, this is the one to start with. Send it out twice a year and just, this is like really what you're using to understand your general customer sentiment. It's not necessarily tied to a specific event. So it's just, how are customers feeling about this brand or this company? Um, I would start there. But we do have two other industry standard ones. We have customer satisfaction score, and that is generally tied to customer support. So after an interaction with customer support, uh, you'll get a survey saying, how satisfied were you with that experience? Um, and that's on a zero to 10 point scale. And then the last one that we have uh, for industry standard surveys is customer effort score. Uh, and that is measuring ease and efficiency. So let's say you change something on the website or you change something on, in your software, uh, you can send out a survey like this experience uh, made it easy to handle my issue or this organization made it easy to handle my issue. Um, those are industry standards. And what I love about industry standard surveys is it's so easy, right? Like you don't have to think about what the, how to word the question. You also can compare it to your peers. Um, it's, it's very quite easy to use, but if none of those are working for you, create your own survey. We can do that in HubSpot. And not to talk too much about the Service Hub software certification, but we do have a lesson all about creating your own surveys and like best practices. So if you are interested in that, check that out. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, we have those surveys and we also have ways to send them out via automation. Um, and of course, a dashboard to understand who's filling out these surveys, what scores are you getting, and uh, just helping you think through what to do next. I think uh, something I can add here is, uh, uh, while it is in incredibly important, right, to uh, in, in sending out surveys, uh, to be able to track the health of the business and track your major metrics, I think there's also an element that that gets left behind sometimes in terms of being able to leverage uh, survey feedback uh, on calls or in in conversation with clients. So making sure that you have tools um, on phone chat, SMS, and all of that uh, that give you easy access to to survey results. Um, so you can you know whether they follow up that survey with a phone call to you and you have to pull it up quickly. Um, or if you're reaching out to them, having access and being able to reference, hey, I saw this feedback, thank you, noted, we're making this change, this is how we fix it, um, can help, I think, customers feel extremely, extremely heard and valued. Um, anytime they fill out a survey, they're really expecting you, they're going to expect you know, your support team and CS team to have access to, to all of those anyways. Um, and they don't want to repeat themselves. So the, the more that we can, you know, make sure that we have easy access to those results um, for our one-to-one our -one conversations as well, uh, the better. Yeah, that's a great point, Jake. Um, and of course, all of the feedback survey is going to be on the company record, the contact record. So your customer service team, as you mentioned, can access it, but also your sales team, your marketing team. So you are hitting the right folks with the right message. I love it. And Megan, I'm not sure if you had anything um, to add. Looks like maybe not. Maybe, I don't know if you do. I would just echo ease of use. Like I can't stress that enough. Um, we've all mentioned it plenty of times already, but most of the feedback I hear right away after we've started using Service Hub pretty regularly is, wow, this is really easy, not only to send the surveys, but to see those results. Lovely. And I finally have audio so I can hear all of you now, which is wonderful. <laughs> Sorry if I seemed so weird before. Okay. Um, so I've got question three in front of us here. What are some use cases for leveraging customer feedback data to deliver a better post-purchase experience? Um, you know, we've, we've kind of talked through or, or I'll just let you guys talk. But basically, I, I love to hear more about, um, you know, different different use cases here too. Yeah, I'll start here. Um, I was talking to the group about this a little bit earlier and I have kind of like two different clients that use Service Hub in two different ways. So one of the clients, uh, they, they offer some live events and online courses and 
they send an NPS survey after the course is complete asking like on a scale of one to 10, how happy were you with this course name? And from there they can understand, okay, what were we doing right? So they'll follow up with people that are happy with, you know, thank you. Um, what specific topic did you like? If possible, would you mind um, review, sharing your positive review somewhere? And then if they're unhappy, they can, they'll send an email and say, we're going to reach out, we're going to call you and learn more about this experience if we have your permission. If not, can you, you know, fill out a form and let us know what you didn't like. Um, that way, so they can understand specific events, um, how happy or unhappy someone is. So it's a little different than maybe some people might think of using the surveys, but it really works for them. And they've been able to kind of pinpoint what makes, you know, their customers happy afterwards. And then if they um, would be willing to join them at another event or, um, you know, upsell, cross sell, that kind of thing. Um, I think I can dive into my other client unless someone had anything else. Okay. So another one of my clients, they're in the financial industry and they use Service Hub to its fullest ability, ticketing, um, communications inbox, pretty much anything Service Hub offers, they utilize it. And the way that they found success is that prior to using Service Hub, they were having their customers, you know, call them, fill out a form on their website, email them, use their app. Like it was just like there was um, customers coming in from all angles and their customer success team really had a hard time, you know, making sure that first of all, these issues were followed up with. And then also maybe like a, an action plan. And also they had maybe someone would call them and submit a form. So it was just really messy. Um, they started using service hubs. So they were able to put all of the information in one platform and then once they resolved some of the issues, they could start surveying their customers. And I will say like the first set of surveys we sent out, maybe it wasn't the prettiest results, um, but at, over time we could start seeing that growth in customer happiness. That's awesome. I love that it also like offered a way to continue that growth by you know, it's like you could see the trends almost and then be able to say like, okay, here's exactly what we need to fix. Um, but seeing that that overall growth of customer happiness had to have been really satisfying. And their customer success team was thrilled. Like at first they're like, oh, you're going to measure like our close date, like how long it takes us to close a ticket or how happy they are, a customer feels afterwards. But then like in the long run, they're like, this has made our lives so much easier. Um, I think it's important, as you mentioned, um, is to really understand the customer feedback that comes in and almost have a culture of that everyone in your company needs to know what's being said, or everyone in the organization needs to know what's being said about X event. Um, really kind of like a culture of understanding the feedback that comes through. Um, and that's going to be like everyone for NPS. And just a couple folks uh, for the like people who are putting on an event. Um, I think otherwise it kind of just lies on like the heads or the tops of the organization. And the responsibility really should fall on everyone in the company to know who's saying what. And when the responsibility lies on everyone, uh, there's more collaborations, there's bigger and better solutions. Um, so I love that use case. And I just think it's important for like everyone to know exactly what's being said and how they can help improve that score. 100%, yeah. I also really love that uh, the, the use case you mentioned and that a uh, big pain they were having is scattered comms, right? Um, how can you even leverage customer feedback if it's in a million places? Um, so making sure everything is centralized, um, which also just uh, helps you understand, um, get a deeper, deeper analysis of you know, uh, like you mentioned, uh, how long it's taking to close out tickets. Um, what are uh, what are our waiting times? What are our, our, our common complaints? Um, let's just escalate those tickets more quickly and automate a lot of that process. Um, and also save, you know, a lot of time per call, get on calls faster, be able to work with more customers a day. 
um, the more we have it automated. So, yeah, and I should have added that that second client I was talking about. They were using AirCall, and that's one of the reasons they started using Service Hub too, because they were like, "Oh, we are in HubSpot. We are using AirCall. Like, let's make sure this is all integrated." And that was really easy too. So, love it. <laughs> This is, it resonates so much. I know that, um, you know, a fair amount of our audience and a fair amount of the individuals that register for our Smart Take series are marketers. Um, and I, myself, obviously, am a marketer. And just knowing um, how much I appreciate being able to see both the things that our clients are loving and wanting more of, and also the pain points of our clients, like as a marketer, that's so important for me to close that loop. Um, because it affects everything that I then do in terms of my next round of marketing, right? Of, of my next campaigns and like talking to those, those issues that we can help solve and working with our RevOps team, you know, so looking at the client services department, looking at the sales department, the marketing department, all of us working together in that, you know, in that flywheel to make sure that we've got everything connected and, um, and that we're all working towards the same kind of goal there. So when we, that ties us well into the next question here. Um, in terms of the flywheel, what can we do to benefit from our happy clients too, right? Like we we feed those happy clients, we get those happy customers, then we want to hear from them what's going on and, you know, how do they feel about these things? Um, and then we have the ones that are kind of evangelists um, that are loving everything and couldn't be happier. Um, and so what do we do to really enable those individuals who rate high to continue to be and, um, evangelists and to continue with that that customer delight with them as well. From the tech side of things, um, this is like the easiest part of the whole process is just knowing who your happiest clients are because we have workflows. Um, so all you need to do is set up a workflow that notifies you when someone gives you a nine or 10 on an NPS survey, or maybe it could just be a property in the CRM um, but just something to indicate that these are my happiest clients and these are the people that I should reach out to for X, Y, and Z. Um, and I bet if I just had to guess, if everyone in this room thinks about the last purchase they made online, I bet like 90% of us probably read a review from someone who had purchased this in the past. So that's just kind of setting it up of like how important it is to leverage your happiest customers and to really spin that flywheel. Yeah, and that actually leads right into what I'd like to add because knowing who your evangelists are allow you to spread word of mouth digitally. Like you're going to be able to ask them for reviews, um, maybe even engage them for case studies or client testimonials. I've seen some really cool things where you know, you're utilizing some of the quotes that your customers are saying about you in some of these surveys and using them in social media campaigns, um, obviously with their permission, and um, just like showcasing how happy your customers are. So then, like we have already mentioned, you can use that as word of mouth to make sure that other people are seeing how happy your customers are. Um. Uh, something I can add here is uh, uh, on the air call side, we use, uh, uh, I, I mentioned tags a lot, uh, a lot of words from dispositions uh, and call results. Um, we, use a, we use a custom property here that, that, that makes this really easy. So it's something I recommend to everyone is uh, you, can, you can divide this up or just have a tag that's like great customer feedback. On, and the reason I guess backtracking, the reason why I recommend this is so often the best feedback you get is just impromptu on calls with a support rep, with a sales rep, with a CSM, um, uh, not necessarily in, in, a, in a feedback survey, but just on a call like, hey, I love this so much. This has made our lives so much easier. And being able to just tag that call, um, now you have a recorded, uh, you know, uh, you, you already have it recorded there. Um, you can have an active list set up for all those to flow into and just have marketing be able to pick through those, reach out uh, for more context um, and get some some really good, some really good material out of it. I love it. I think we might have time for one more question. Um, might be kind of quick so that we can get to some audience questions if those come through as well. Um, but let's see if we can talk through this a tiny bit. So this is, 
nuanced, right? What is a good goal? Um, how, you know, how do we really identify the customer journey and stories through feedback and, and service hub data? Like, I, I don't even want to ask you guys to answer this, but I do. How do our clients, how, you know, how, how do you help individuals determine what that goal can be or, you know, so they can move forward with using this data? Well, I think I talked a little bit about this too, and I hate to say it, but it really does depend on your industry and your overall goals. Um, so usually I'll ask, you know, do you have any benchmarking data that we can start with as um, sort of to gauge where we think we want to be? But most of the time that's not available. So we may like start by sending out a a survey or of some sort knowing that there will probably it will probably serve as our benchmarking in the in the future so long-term goals are probably more appropriate and in the meantime measuring month over month or week even week over week if you're sending a lot of surveys to just see that positive um in impact that you could see overall um what was i going to add i think there was something else mm. oh the the thing that makes so even though you may not be able to have a specific number within your dashboard, you'll be able to quickly see the impact your surveys are mate having and then like the ticketing close time and that kind of thing almost immediately. You don't have to wait a specific amount of time there. So as time goes on, better benchmarking at first, just start to understand your audience a little bit more and the impact your surveys are having. So that's a roundabout answer. <laughs> I think I think that's really helpful in terms of like it sounds like even just having KPIs. Then like you can pull those KPIs really quickly from that that dashboard um, to then be able to set those goals. And you know they could be other pieces could be goals as well. But that sounds like a great way to kind of get started and get that foothold. Yeah, I think uh, another really important thing to be tracking here, in addition to you know the uh, overall. A customer happiness is also just i guess the overarching theme here is how easy is it to get in touch with your team so setting slas on what is your email response time and like what like how how long do we have when an email comes in to get a response how uh, uh how long are your folks waiting on hold i think hubspot is kind of famous for this at this point that when you call their support team they pick up immediately um that's maybe not attainable for everyone but uh we can have slas on on, on waiting time of course um, on chat, what is the SLA there? Um, and from there, we can sort of break that down into uh, having goals like no more missed calls ever um, and, uh, and and have some things to strive for. Um, but yeah, just tracking how easy is it to get in touch with your team um, because that way you can, you know, make sure they're happy before they have a chance to, to not be as well, so. Lovely. I, I agree. I think it's important. Um, those SLAs can really, they just set the expectation, right? Um, internally. And, you know, if you want to have those things publicly visible too, that's an option to make your, your user, you know, to affect your user experience. If you have it in the chat, like we will respond within five minutes or, you know, and just sort of make that public too. It could, it could potentially help your user experience. Um, it looks like we do have a few questions coming in from the chat. All right, I'll get us kicked off here. So from Ale, um, she wants to know what customer satisfaction metric should I be most concerned about? Who wants to take this one? I can add, but you're not gonna like my answer probably <laughs> because it really depends once again what are your goals? And the reason I keep bringing that up is because a lot of times people are tempted to just send surveys to send them to check that off their goals um, as far as, you know, making sure that there's an NPS survey going out. But what it is that you actually care about the most is probably very industry specific or even company specific. Maybe it's where I would recommend starting is asking your customer success team and going from there. I'd agree. I think the one that we see most common come from companies is NPS. And that's just because, again, the goals are like, you just want to understand general customer sentiment. Um, so I think that is the one that we see being utilized most often, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's right for everyone. 
I can say at air call our our north star for uh, for this is is definitely MPS. Um, it's just gives you a view on how are we all doing, all of us, you know. Love it. Um, all right, we've got another follow up question from Ale. So she wants to know, and I I can't wait to hear your answer on this. She wants to know how do we get people to fill out the surveys? You know, what if nobody's what if you're sending them out, and nobody's filling them out. This is the hardest part. <laughs> it's actually collecting the feedback. Um, and there's a such thing as survey fatigue. So you want to make sure that you are probably sending NPS twice a year, no more. Um, and also probably not like after a big crit sit or something like that, just to make sure nothing is skewed. Um, but you want to make sure that you send them out only in appropriate times, um, not just like spamming people with surveys. And two, and I wonder what the rest of you folks think about this, but incentives. That's a great way to get people to start responding. You just want to make sure you're incentivizing them to fill out the survey, not necessarily to give you a nine or a 10, right? Um, so in the beginning, in the early days, we used to give away like free consultation sessions if you filled out a survey, a raffle. I don't know if we do tickets to inbound anymore, but things like that to just help folks, you know, incentivize them to start filling them out. Um, what do you guys think? Yeah, I, I think as well, um, it's making sure that the folks who are filling out surveys know that they're heard and understood is, is following up on those surveys. Um, someone leaves you a great review, give them a call, thank them. If they give a bad review, um, give them a call, ask, uh, you know, check in. Um, I think when they know that you see the surveys, that you care and that uh, uh, they feel heard, they're going to be more incentivized to do it. This doesn't solve the not doing it in the first place, but, you know, from a flywheel standpoint, um, having that as the best habit, I think over time will we'll, we'll have a good impact here. Yeah, and that actually made me think of another time when a client was sending the a survey after the they closed a ticket like how was your interaction with us and if it, there was a negative one they actually opened a ticket back up and contacted the person and then tried to resolve the issue and then they were sent another survey and then hoping for that positive review that time and like almost 90 percent of that time when they sent that second one they the person was like oh they really do care they heard me and this time i am satisfied or if not they were clear on what the resolution should be. I love that. If I were on the receiving end of that, I would be so thrilled because like you said, like to know that they were, that they, they saw my feedback and they responded immediately and were like concerned about the situation um, and wanted to make it better. I, I can see it's, it's validating that that second survey then provided those good results of, mm -hmm. all right, like, this check the box that I needed it to check because things happen. And I think all of us as humans are, um, we acknowledge that and nobody's going to hold, you know, hold accidents or, or certain situations um, to a company, but especially when they respond accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just nice validation for those, for those that are working on programs like this and trying, trying their hardest to keep clients and customers happy. Um, that's a great, a great little bonus in their direction. All right. I'm not sure if we have any more chats coming through. We'll give it another second um, as we wrap up here. Um, we we do, like I said, we will be sending this recording um, out to everybody that registered. Um, we will have, um, I believe we've got a few pieces of content, some resources that we'll be attaching with those um, that follow-up email as well so that you can have more to follow through on. Um, and we'll even provide some links into the HubSpot Academy so you can continue your education within there as well. Um, there are no other questions, though. I would love to just thank our panelists here for taking the time uh, to speak with you all and be subject matter experts um, on the Service Hub and customer surveys and dashboards and all things in that um, that section of the flywheel. So thank you all today, Megan, Ajuti, Jake. It's been lovely having you, and I appreciate everything that you've been able to. Oh, we do have another question. All right, hold on one second. Hold that thought. <laughs> All right, so from Christine, she said she wants to know about types of questions it looks like. Um, she says multiple choice, open, or a mix. I'm guessing she's wanting to know like what's the best 
option here, what gets you the best results. In those industry standard um, questions, they are one sliding scale from like zero to 10 or zero to seven, and then a text box. Um, the text box is not required. Um, it's obviously helpful, but we see from research that if you, the more you require, the more people are not gonna send them out. So um, I would have it no more than five questions if you're doing your own custom survey, none are required um, and like no more than one or two open ended questions because you want to like think up through the effort that it has to take and multiple choice sliding scales are the easiest. Um, so if you're worried about not pe people not responding, make them all like multiple choice with maybe one um, open response. But if people are getting tons of responses, maybe you can open it up to like a little more complicated of questions. I do see another question that came through as well. Um, everybody heard that I was closing this out and they're like, wait, got a question. Um, so Diego, we were just talking about this behind the scenes before the webinar started. So he wants to know how many responses for a survey is fair or acceptable enough to determine the sentiment with on the mark accuracy. Um, and then he talks about, you know, he's saying kind of like following up from that, assuming that people are not always open to completing surveys. So he's looking for that bottom threshold number of <laughs> how many people do you need to have take a survey? I can go for it. No, I was just going to say you shared with us, Nikki, something really fascinating that would probably resonate here. So why don't you take it away? <laughs> okay, perfect. That's I was like, I can hop in. It's not 100% <laughs> all of it, but it kind of is. Um, so I've actually been We've been working with um, Databox, one of our technology partners. They have a new sort of tech that they've rolled out that's a benchmarking. They've got this benchmarking program and you can enroll into these different benchmark groups. And what you're doing is you're connecting your HubSpot data um, into Databox data and then you're getting anonymized and pooled. And, um, and then you can kind of see where you sit in that specific benchmark group. It could be, you know, your industry or, or whatnot. Um, and you can see where your things like your traffic and all of that gets gets kind of aligned with with that group. Um, and in talking with him in this program that they've set up, they have a minimum thresh threshold of 15. Um, and so the the data can't even be viewed until 15 individuals or 15 companies have opted into that specific group. Um, and so I know that they are huge on data. They're, they're called Databox um, and that they have so much um, strategy and knowledge behind everything that they do in their programs. Um, so when I heard that 15 number, I was like, oh, that to me would also resonate with this, um, that you would have that kind of like 15 as your as your minimum um, when you're trying to trying to find that like more of a holistic view. Um, the, the And that's just like to open up. He prefers 50, <laughs> but the 15 is just to like open up and even see the data. So I would probably say that's a good point to like not even really take into consideration, uh, you know, what it looks like holistically under that 15 number. Yeah. And I think it's almost important to consider like percentage, like of the people that you're sending out the survey to, you know, my one client that's doing it post event, there's only like 25 people in a course. So, you know, is it more important to get five, you know, so it all depends on that specific, the specific scenario. Um, and I'm sorry, I just said it depends again, but it really does. <laughs> um, but I agree with Nikki too. There, you probably need to at least have a good amount to really draw conclusions. That's a great point though, that it could be like per campaign and that campaign might have a smaller subset of an audience than like your entire database of contacts. So, or database of clients, customers. We've got another one that just came in. <laughs> this will probably be our last one before we need to close out at the 45 minute mark. Um, so Travis wants to know, oh, okay, I can probably answer this. Will there be a recording of this session sent out? Yes, um, not a problem, Travis. Um, we will, you'll get that recording within, by the end of the week. All right. Well, again, thank you all. I'm not gonna go through the whole, sh whole spiel again, but um, I just appreciate all of you for taking the time and we will follow up with all of the audience. Um, after the webinar with the recording and any extra resources. All right. Thanks, everyone.